Thank you, the media. Thank you, everyone. We give thanks to the Lord for bringing us to this very day. He's been so gracious. He's been so good to us. I mean, we can't, for me anyway, I can't thank God enough for what I have learned from him, you know, from, for, for the deposits of his grace into my own heart and my own life since this week. We thank him and we give him praise. Now, I want to continue in the ongoing discussion, which is preparing the nations for the return of Christ through you know, compassionate intercessory prayers. We've looked at the aspect of repentance, the need for us to repent in order to prepare the nations or to compare the nations or to inspire the nations to see the need to repent. Because you can't get somebody to go through a path you haven't been through before. We've gone through that and it's something that needs to revisit us again and again. St. Paul say, I die daily. I die daily. That means I bring myself to a crucified life on daily basis. Living holy, returning back to God, repenting from your error is not a once in a while thing. It's a daily journey, a daily walk to review yourself, to check your ways and be sure your life is in keeping with the ways and the standard and the principles of God. It's a daily examination. We re-examine ourselves, we re-examine ourselves on daily basis. That is exactly the way to go. Now, we are on the issue of compassionate prayers. And I mean, it's been very mind blowing how God has dissected this issue of compassionate prayer, praying with compassion, not praying with compassion, you know, because of uh, what you want to gain, but praying with compassion because of what God needs to gain, what God needs to gain what God needs to gain. That is the basis of the compassion. That's the basis of the compassionate cry, what God needs to gain. And incidentally, we are talking about the end time. We are talking about the end time. Please, can everybody mute your video? I see Nelly John. Nelly John, can you please mute, mute your video, please? Thank you so much, sir. All right, please. Um, I need every one of us to understand that we are in a season that requires that we pour out our hearts in prayer with the desire, with the passion, with the longing of God in view. All right. Now we have been looking at this scripture of First John, chapter First Peter, rather chapter four, from verse seven. Is one of our focal scripture this period, and I want to read it from here. It says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. The end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Watch unto prayer. Watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity, fervent love among yourself for Charity for love shall cover multitude of sin. He says, have, have what fervent love among yourselves. Have fervent love among yourselves. Verse 8, have fervent love among yourself. Why? For love shall cover the multitude of sin. By love here, the aim of this love is not to make somebody feel good. The aim of this love is to, 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 to recover, to redeem your brother, to redeem your sister, to redeem the family, to redeem the community, to redeem the nation, to ensure that the enemy, the devil, does not triumph over our people, does not rejoice over our people, does not conquer, does not prevail, does not execute his wish and will over our people. 
That means your love can salvage a people. The love that Christ had for me and for you is what brought us to where we are. And he has extended that same ministry of salvation, that same ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people through extension of the love of God to them. That same ministry of extending God's love, extending God's love, not just God's power, not just God's judgment, extending the love of God to people. And that is what will bring them to salvation. All right? The goodness of God brings people to salvation. The love of God brings nations, brings cities, brings people to salvation. And that is what we're here for. Now, he said, when there is this flow of the love of God, it will redeem the nations from their sin, from their iniquity. It takes the love of God to pray compassionate prayer for people you do not know. It takes the love of God to pray compassionate, heart-rending prayer for people who may have offended you or offended your tribe, offended your nation, all right? They may have colonized your nation, oppressed your nation, okay? But you are now crying unto God to salvage, to save them. Now, that is what we are talking about. He said, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. This is not a time to be riotous. This is not a time to be to 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 do things haphazardly, or not thinking mindlessly. No, this is a time to be sober, to be sober, to be sober, reflecting of what shall be the end of the lost, thinking about the end, thinking about the end of the lost, thinking about the end of the wicked, and based on the compassion that generates out of your heart, the compassion that flows from within you as a result of God not being pleased to see the wicked perish, that compassion captures you. That compassion captures you. It makes you to be so sober-minded because you are reflecting not on your problem, not on your need, not on your want, no, but you are reflecting on the heartbeat of God, the need of God, the burden of God has been placed on you as a result of fellowship, as a result of intimacy. He has impacted his burden, his concerns, his program, his passion into you. And based on the passion of God, you go into prayer. Now, I was looking at the prayer life of Jesus Christ this morning in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 7, and it caught my attention. Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 7, from verse 7 to verse 9, it says, and who in the days of his flesh, when he had, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, First Peter chapter 5 from verse 7, he said, in the world, but in the end, are we together? First Peter chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 7. He said, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying, oh, sorry, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5, I'm sorry, please. Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 7. So who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers with supplication, and strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. He was heard in that he feared. He was heard in that he feared. I want you to pause a little there. It said in the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and with tears. Who is this scripture referring to? That's Christ Jesus. He offered up prayers and supplication with strong cryings, with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. The next verse, verse 8, he says, though he was a son, he were a son, yet left he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all men that obey him. Now, going back to that verse 7, I need you to please understand the life of Christ, the kind of compassionate prayer we saw in him, he exemplified. He said, 
Why Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings, prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Three things stand out there for me. Number one, the depth of the prayer of Christ. He offered up prayers and pleadings, pleading with God with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And I remember I shared this a couple of times here. Was he praying that the father should make him not to go to the cross? That was not it, to save him from dying? No. At some point, like we saw in the book of Luke chapter 22 from verse 43. Luke chapter 22 from verse 43. Let me connect it to you. It says, and when they had fulfilled the days, and when they had fulfilled the days, and they returned, the Christ Jesus started behind Jerusalem, and Joseph, no, that's not the place. Luke chapter 22, please. Luke chapter 22. Then an angel appeared, appeared and strengthened him. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. Verse 44. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down from to the ground, falling down to the ground. Now, if you connect those two you know, scriptures, it tells us the kind of prayer Jesus Christ was found praying. When we talk about compassionate prayer, prayer that is from a broken heart, prayer that is from a bleeding heart. The scripture say that Jesus Christ prayed through the strength that came on him. At some point, he was giving up. An angel of the Lord was sent to strengthen him. And having received that strength, I know some people here may have gone through all kinds of challenges of life that seem to wear you out. Be it family issues, be it financial issues, job issues, different kind of storms come our way as ambassadors of God especially in this end time, because of the activities of the enemy that are channeled at believers and especially the elect, which I believe you are one of the elect. There are so many attacks on God's people. It's not about you, it's global, it's global. It's, it's not, it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's not a, I mean, you don't need a prophet to tell you the reasons. Because the enemy is so threatened, is so furious against those who want to stop him from conquering the world. He's so determined to discourage them, to make them, to weary them so that they will give up the fight for him to have a good time in ruining the destiny of the people of God in this end time. And because of it, there are so many precious people are going through. But in the midst of it all, God gives grace and double grace to enable you to stay on until you win the battle. Remember, he has won the battle for us that we might remain overcomers and more than conquerors. And we saw in this portion that Jesus Christ himself was being strengthened. So one of our prayer for one another, Lord, strengthen my sisters, strengthen my brothers, strengthen my pastor, strengthen the people that you have used to build me up and the people I'm building up for you as well. Lord, let there be strength. Let's hold our hand with one another, you know, and stand there for one another to ensure that nobody grows weak, nobody grows feeble. Even those who are wounded in the battle, we help to strengthen them. So God saw that Christ Jesus' his son was getting wearied and send him help. Angel came from heaven to strengthen him. And having been strengthened, the Bible said he went on forward to pray. And being in, in, in agony, he prayed very earnestly, very earnestly. That's verse 44. He prayed very earnestly and his sweat was 
as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I'm asking myself, what kind of prayer is this? That the sweat of a man will be like blood. The sweat, the sweat was as it were great drops of blood. All right. The New Living Translation said he prayed very fev more fervently and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. It was heavy, like a rain of blood, like a rain of blood coming because of the agony, the passion. And what was the essence of this passion? What was the root, the basis? What was behind this passion? He wasn't praying because he was afraid of going to the cross. He was praying because of the passion in his heart to see the world saved, to see the nation saved. He's not willing that any should perish. His father sent him on a mission, and the mission is go pay the price to save the entire world, pay the price to ensure that no mortal misses eternity with us, no mortal misses eternity with us. Go pay the price. And the price was heavy on him. Because of it, he began to pray. So having said that, if you look at the book of Hebrews again, from verse, from verse 12 to verse 24, 22 rather, Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 22, Hebrews 12, 23, he said, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Now, this morning, the Lord said to me, we, shall, we should spend time to pray. We should spend time to pray today. All right. So in the next five minutes or so, we shall begin to pray. I want us to know as we get into this prayer that we have not just, I know you are sitting in your room or maybe in your parlor or wherever, but we want to ascend the mountain and come to Zion. We want to come to Zion. He said, but ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city, unto the city, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. I want us to step up this morning to the heavenly Jerusalem, the place called heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable company of angels, where the angels of God are gathered. I want you to visualize yourself sitting among angels, sitting among angels, sitting among the heavenly Jerusalem. All right, he says in verse 23, and to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, we are gathered to the general assembly, the general assembly. The first of the, the church, the gen, sorry, the general assembly, sorry, and the church of the firstborn. Today is Sunday in Africa, all right? People will be going to church any moment from now, including myself. We'll be going to church, but there is a church we want to worship with this morning before we go to our local churches. We want to have fellowship with the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God of the judge of, to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. As I was reflecting on this this morning, I was seeing ourselves seated and gathered together with the general assembly of the saints who have gone to glory. I see ourselves sitting before, not before our pastor, not before our general overseer, no, but sitting before the throne of the God, the judge of all. We are not gathering before him to bring judgment over the nation. We are gathering before him as advocates for the redemption of nations. We are gathering before the judge of all. We are gathering before the a general assembly to appeal, to appeal for the redemption of our communities, the redemption of our cities, the redemption of our nation, the redemption of our own generation. And he says, we are gathering unto the spirits of just men made perfect. I am seeing ourselves seated before people like Babalola of Nigeria, the great intercessor. I'm seeing ourselves sitting before people like you know, Daniel Nash, that incredible intercessor, 
that prayed for Charles Finney. And record has it that anywhere Charles Finney was going to pray, going to preach, going for crusade, going for conference or whatever, before Charles Finney would get there, you know, you know, Daniel Nash will, would have been there for a long period of time interceding with his team, interceding, watering the ground, watering the ground, just like Jesus who is normally send his disciples to go before him, go to the villages, the cities, the communities he wants to visit and prepare the ground. This man will go and water the ground with prayer. And by the time Charles Finney comes, it's like electricity, it's like carrying a vo high voltage presence, high voltage presence of God that will capture the community, capture the land, capture the animals, capture trees, capture human beings. Everywhere will be set on fire because of prayer that has preceded the appearance or the arrival of the man. Some of such men, people may not know them very well, but the, the, the level they put on, their investment in advancing God's kingdom is unquantifiable. You can't price it, it's priceless. So I see us gathering in the same room this morning with people like D.L. Moody, people like John Hyde, all right, who will stand and hold on to God and say, Lord, give me in there or take my life. Give me in there or take my life. People who have so much passion not for good people to make it, but for people who, who are wicked, who are godless, who are worshiping idol, but they bend themselves and say, God, I am not asking for myself. I am asking that these people might be saved, that these people might be saved. People like Paul, who spent until he was spent. People like Paul, who will make himself all things, all things to all men who will make himself all things to all men that he might by all means, by all means save some. Who will go from city to city, from community to community, praying and crying openly, knocking at doors, pleading that the people might return back to God. I see ourselves seated with them. He said to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, all right, which are written in heaven and to God, the judge of all, the judge of all, not to execute judgment, as I said earlier, but to say, Lord, you are the judge who does not want the wicked to perish. You want them to be saved, but you need people who will stand in the gap, who will stand in the gap to share their, your passion towards them and to share their weaknesses, to extend their weaknesses to heaven and extend heaven to them. That is what we're here for. So we are here to represent the church of the firstborn, the general assembly, to plead the case of the people of our generation that they will not perish, but that they will be saved, that they will not end up in disaster. And the enemy is wishing and planning and preparing and forcing his agencies and his agents to carry it out, but that God will enter vain and rescue and rescue in a hurry our people our nations our communities our families our generation on the basis of his grace so this morning we are going to pray and as we pray please remember we are not praying because we are better than the people who are not saved we are praying because the grace of god has given us a privileged position all right, to be at peace with God so that we will help them also to experience the mercy of God. We will hold on to God to plead like Moses did. We saw in the course of the week, God got so wounded, so heartbroken, so disappointed with the people of Israel and wanted to go and wipe them out, to wipe them out. All right, look at Africa, look at Europe, look at Australia, look at the people in in, in, in you know, what is going on in Ukraine, look at what is going on all over the world, all of North America, all of South America, all of Asia, consider the wickedness, consider the abomination of different kinds, the idolatry, the idol worship, the immorality, the, the, the wickedness, the witchcraft, the bloodshed, the killings, and all kinds of wicked oppression against the people of God. Now, 
God wanted to wipe them out because of his disappointment. These are people that God did mysterious wonders in the land of Egypt to preserve them, to multiply them, to increase them, and finally to bring them out with a mighty hand. Did miracles they never heard, they never saw. And all these God did, the people turned against him and began to murmur against him and murmur against Moses and began to wish they were still in bondage, in captivity. They forgot all the things God did. And when God wanted to wipe them out, Moses stood his place as a priest, as an intercessor, and began to advocate on their behalf. God, please, as per whether they deserve to be wiped out, no question about it, but please, I want you to repent from what you had intended to do. Don't go there. Don't do it. Yes. Can you do it? Yes. Should you do it? Yes. But I am standing to say, no, don't do it. If you do it, the other nations will say you didn't have the power to preserve them and to fulfill your promise to them. And God repented. God withdrew from what he wanted to do and preserve the people of Israel. He was so passionate that he said, well, if you will not hear me, then I prefer you delete my name from your book. Delete my name from your book. By implication, I don't mind to go to hell. I don't mind to be destroyed, to go to hell, to go to hell than for Israel to be destroyed. Rather save them and destroy me. And God said, no, God forbid, for, you know, it shall not be mentioned. I will not destroy you because of their wickedness. I will rather forgive them because of you. Now we're standing here to say, Lord, looking at the way things are going, even in our own community, in fact, even in our own family, in our own church, in our own area of work, there are people that one would have wished God to strike with his judgment, but it's not so with him in this New Testament. So we want to stand in the gap to say, God, we want to hold hand with people, our fathers of faith, the priests who labored for the nations, people who have watered the earth with their blood. They have watered the earth for their, with their blood. The song we were singing yesterday, that caused you know, a serious awakening amongst many after this meeting of yesterday. You know, people stayed back, worshiping in tears. That song, one of the statements that caught my heart was talking about the gospel that came to us with this, through the sacrifice of our predecessors. The people that ran this race before us, they made costly sacrifices. They paid costly price. They paid costly price to return the gospel, to return the gospel. And today, many people to whom the mantle is handed over, to whom the baton is handed over, are handling the gospel, you know, with trivial, mundane, casual attention. It's like a pleasure trip not knowing the cost of the gospel, what the gospel cost God and what it cost the people that handed it over to us. Like I said, some of them had to preserve the gospel with their blood. Some of them were, were, were thrown into lion's den and the lions ate them. Some of them were skinned alive, burnt alive, burnt alive because they were not willing to give up their faith. They were willing to stand for the gospel and insist that this gospel shall not die, but this gospel will conquer the world. And they had to pay the price. Some of them, you know how they went through terrible afflictions to ensure that the gospel is not diluted, is not thwarted, is not twisted, it is upheld. Today is a different journey. And we are not staying, saying here that we are better than anybody, but we are saying that God who has given us the grace to intercede for the remedy of the damages that have been done to the gospel, that he will hasten it even in our days. So I'm going to stop here so that we begin to pray. Shall we begin to pray? I want you first of all, our first prayer this morning is, Lord, help us to realize that the end is here. The end is here and to hasten in all we do, in our prayers, in our planning, and we in business. Lord, help me to hasten my wealth creation ventures, to hasten to make wealth, to teach, 
to disciple, to pray, to preach, to do evangelism, whatever I'm to do, help me to do it with a sense of urgency, with a sense of urgency, with the clarity of the fact that the end is here. So whatever I do, I need to do it with every sense of fervency, fervency, knowing that I will soon give account of what I did with the businesses God gave to me, with the marriage God gave to me, with the children God gave to me, with the ministry God gave to me, I will be called to give account of it. And if I am found wanting, I will suffer loss. May God forbid. God help me and help the church, help the body of Christ across the globe to wake up to the consciousness of the fact that the end is here, therefore fervency is needed. Shall we go ahead and pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come unto you this morning. We're calling upon you, Lord Jesus, to help us. Lord, we, this generation to whom the end is come, unto whom the end is come. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord, help us, Lord, to understand everything that is happening is just because the end is here, Lord. The end of all things is here, Lord. The end of all things is here, Lord. The end of all things is here, Lord. Father, help us. In Prenaka, the Kendra, the Kendra, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I want us to pray this prayer from the book of Revelation chapter, chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He says, behold, Revelation 3 verse 11, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. I want us to pray, Lord, regarding my beginning with myself, all right, and the servants on this platform and your servants across the globe. Father, we are praying, let none of us lose our crown. Why will people lose their crown at the end of the day? You see it in the same Revelation chapter two, verse four. He was addressing the church that they have lost their first love. He said, ne ne nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou has left thy first love. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. Thou has left thy first love. Thou has left thy first love. I want us to pray, Lord, let none of us lose our first love. We pray for your servants across Africa. We pray for your servants across Europe, Asia, Australia, North and South America. We pray for your servants, the intercessor, the fivefold ministers. We pray for your servants who have been laboring in the field. You know, the devil wishes to see those who are involved in advancing the kingdom of God lose their reward at the end of the day. That's his wish. That's his wish. And we are here to say, Lord, strength as you strengthen your servant, Jesus, your son, as you strengthen Jesus, where we read, the Bible said, when the realities of the cup downed on him, he cried out in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, 
if that, that if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Let this. If Jesus could get to that point, if Jesus could get to that point, I promise you, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he falls. Many mighty have fallen off. Many mighty have fallen off. If you read the, take time and study the history of most of the revivalists, you, you, will be, you will be wondering how some of them actually ended. Some of them, the enemy attacked them so massively that the way they ended was not the way they were expected to end. So our prayer is, Lord, help the wounded brothers, help the wounded sisters, strengthen each one of us that no one will lose his crown. I will not lose my crown. You will not lose your crown. I won't let you lose your crown. Don't let me lose my crown. Let's hold one another. Hold the ministers, hold our pastors, hold our mentors in prayer that none shall lose their first love. Losing the first love means losing your first your crown. When people lose their first love, that consecration, that unconditional release of themselves, abandoning of themselves in the love of Christ. When they lose that intimacy, they lose everything. Let nobody lose their intimacy. This is our prayer. Shall we go ahead and pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we stand here to say our brothers and our sisters shall not lose our first love. Therefore, we shall not lose our first love. We shall not lose our crown. We shall not lose our crown. Lord, we hold the hand of one another as we rise to the first love. We shall not lose our first love. You are my sovereign love. You are my ruler love. Is our life Jesus? Is our life God? We love those who are my first love. Thank you. in Jesus mighty name we pray amen now listen to this and he said unto me that's revelation chapter 22 from verse 10 to verse 12 he said and he said unto me seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand, the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And hold, said, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. To give every man according to his work shall be. You know, there are statements God makes, and you know that this statement, he made it 
you know, how best do I put it? Let me put it in, in this way. God does not want anyone to lose the reward of his labor, all right? And that is why he's admonishing us that as we labor, we should make sure we labor according to the rule, according to the rule, according to the standards of God, so that at the end of the day, when your work shall be tried with fire, it shall not suffer loss, all right? So now he will reward every man according to his work, I want you to look at the missionaries out there in, 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 the, in, the, in the Asian nations. Look at the missionaries out there in different parts of North Africa. Look at the missionaries in different parts of the world where there is wickedness, oppression, Islamic you know, you know, regulations and very difficult conditions that make it difficult for people to penetrate such territory. That's why many Christians, many ministers, they don't even bother to go into such areas. They concentrate in these nations and cities where there are no restriction to the gospel. You can do anything you want to do. You can start your church you know, in the open field. You can do anything you want to do. You have the liberty. But those territories where there is strong restriction, churches, nobody wants to risk his life. All right? And these are the areas where darkness has conquered and is prevalent. And if there be anywhere the gospel is needed, it's in those territories. But who will go? How will they go? How will they penetrate? Yet there are some people who are there laboring. And there are some people who are warm enough to go and labor there. I want us to pray that these people, at the end of the day, their labor shall not be wasted. That they will live to see the fruit of their labor. That God will uphold them and keep them and preserve them. He said, behold, I come quickly. I come quickly and my reward is with me. My reward is with me. To reward every man, every woman, according to his work. I want us to pray, Lord, let our brothers and our sisters, I am your brother, and you are my brother, you are my sister, all right? Those in North America, those in far Africa, those in Asia, they are our brothers, they are our sisters. Let's hold hand with them. Let's hold hand with the General Assembly, the General Assembly. Let's hold hand together and say, Lord, hold our brother. He said, let them that are holy remain holy still. Let them that are righteous remain righteous still. And those who have chosen to be unclean, to be filthy, to be unrighteous, so let it be. That is a, a statement of a father who has invested his all to his children, and he doesn't see the reason why they should still be unrighteous and filthy with all he had done for them. So, Lord, let none of our brothers, let none of our sisters remain un, un, unrighteous, remain filthy. Lord, let there be an outpouring of your grace that empowers people to say no to filthy living, to say no to unrighteous living. Let there be the outpouring of that grace of Upon the nations, upon every family, upon every city, so that men and women together will stand upright, living righteously, holily, even as we wait for the reward of our God. Shall we go ahead and pray? Father, I hold my hand with my brothers, I hold my hand with my sisters across Cape Town, across South Africa, across Africa, across the nations of the world. Lord, and I ask you, Lord, to release upon us grace, good Lord, to stay good, to stay faithful, to stay. Right, 
where the site of Tukoro and shine your light in that area. Where the site of Tukoro and 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 the site
Father, in the name of Jesus, we give thanks to you this morning. It is our prayer that you will wake up the mighty men in our churches, in our families, in our cities, in our government. There are mighty men of war. You are positioned in all the sectors of the society, in the schools, in every organization. You, you have not left for yourself witnesses, witnesses, remnants who are to be used as catalysts, as agents of revival. Let these agents of revival be wakened up. Wake us up and help us to become instruments that wake others up. And let there be a massive rising of men of war, men of the kingdom of God across the nations to prepare the communities, to prepare the marketplace, to prepare the government workers, to prepare the police, the army, the navy, to prepare students, to prepare everyone everywhere for the return of Christ. Let there be such rising of such men who are passionate about the return of Christ, passionate about the kingdom of God, passionate about Christ Jesus winning the battle of the soul of nations. Have your way, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.